are in listen-only mode. Well, hello and welcome to the rescheduled event uh, for last Thursday's the ABCs of MIPs, uh, what you can do to still improve your 2015 MU, PQRS, and VBM performance. If you were with us last Thursday, you know we had some technical difficulties, uh, but I think we're good to go today. So I'm very excited to have uh, Tom and Tom and Tom Lee and Beth Hogue back from SA Ignite. Uh, they are experts today on all things MU, PQRS, MIPS related. Uh, Tom Lee is the CEO and founder of SA Ignite with a, uh, a passion and a, and a national thought leadership position for sure in this space that we're talking about today. With him is Beth Hauk. She is the VP of Client Services of SA Ignite and she also has a, a, a deep background and is a legitimate, and I mean serious, legitimate expert on meaningful use. And so we are excited to be having another ABCs of MIPs. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to uh, turn this presentation over to Tom. Uh, it'll go back to Beth and bounce back a little bit, and then we'll leave time, of course, for Q&A. So Tom, I'm going to go ahead and turn this party over to you. And I'm going to go on mute. Let me do that first. Sounds good. Thanks, Carol. Pleasure to be back here again. Um, and wanted to just review what's really happened out there um, in the industry, some key things since last uh, September's, uh, last month's webinar. Um, so first and foremost, and, and Beth will really, really talk, certainly t touch on this, is the, 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 the 2015 Meaningful Use Modified Rule was finalized and released by CMS. Um, and that really is focused primarily around the 90-day reporting window that's, that's now been fully finalized and approved, as well as a, a bunch of other things that uh, Bethel and Dowdy touch on. Uh, there have certainly been a lot of reactions in the field to uh, organizations getting their 2014 uh, value-based modifier uh, QRUR reports that really show their quality and cost scores for that particular performance year. Uh, CMS also uh, discussed a number of technical issues on their side with respect to uh, some of the quality scoring and uh, particularly related to the EHR direct uh, filing mechanism. We touched on that in our webinar last, last week and there continues to be some of the uh, downstream effects of that and uh, some organizations um, going ahead with the informal review process to try to get potential penalties reversed out as a result of that. So you can you can kind of take a look at what we talked about last time as well as some of the other resources um, on our website and, and elsewhere regarding that. Um, also interestingly, uh, a few weeks ago, the uh, MIPS request for information was released by CMS, which covers a, a much broader array of questions that CMS is seeking comment on as it, uh, it really make progress towards uh, MIPS really launching potentially as early as January of 2017. Um, and there's some really interesting topics there. We're, we're certainly exploring that in our LinkedIn group, um, which uh, is, is open for you all to take a look at. Um, if you look, if you go and type in Merit-Based Incentive Payment System in LinkedIn, you'll see us there. Um, and be, be happy to uh, talk with you further there about this RFI. And, and we actually are putting a group of folks together to submit comments to this RFI um, that, that, that really is a sheds a lot of light on um, where CMS is seeing the, or the, the regulations truly trend towards as the MIPS starts to roll out. And then, all of them, by the way, just if we weren't busy enough, there was that other thing uh, with ICD-10 ICD having begun um, October 1st in this time uh, since the last webinar. And that certainly kept a lot of folks busy. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, generally, uh, not, not necessarily hearing a lot of of unexpected angst over that, but it has been keeping a lot of organizations very, very busy. So now we're really standing at a point where 2015 is winding down, and, and we're looking ahead towards the data submission season for a variety of these programs, whether it's meaningful use, uh, PQRS, or others. Um, and one of the questions often around this time of the year is, you know, what more can still be done to try to improve your, your reported performance for this year, you know, given that most of the year has already gone by. And so what Beth and I hope to do is to really give you um, some potential things to think about with respect to this question, um, both in the meaningful use area as well as uh, PQRS and value-based modifier. 
so with that, um, or let me just drop one last pin. There's a lot of these things um, that can still be done for this performance here relate to things you can do in the back office of your organization. In other words, things that don't necessarily require provider workflow change or things happening in the front office, but really back office activities that you can actually have a lot of leverage on in, in terms of being able to do something quickly that could actually make a material difference. All right, so with that, um, let's kind of just review the agenda real quickly here, and then I'll hand it over to Beth on the following slide. Okay, so we're going to go through best top five ways to impact 2015 MU performance with the time that's remaining. I'll go through the three ways to impact PQRS and VBM performance, and we'll get right into Q&A. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and let Beth uh, lead us through this part. Thanks so much, Tom, and uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, Carol, thank you for the nice introduction, calling me an expert on that modified rule. Um, it, it's really questions from all of you that are living it and need to implement it that really make us more experts, so we're really excited to hear your questions later on. Um, but I will try to go through it a little bit um, in weaving it into um, what I think are some of the top five ways you can still impact your MU performance. So do I, can I move this? Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is going to sound super back office, so prepare for that. Um, every year, and we do thousands of attestations, every year we have um, customers that really have to spend a tremendous amount of time confirming their pro provider list. So this is all about, this is definitely a back office item, but do you really know who you're testing for? Confirm the names, spellings, name change. That that has absolutely come up. Um, you, you'd be surprised. Um, the other key one is their attestation history. So while um, the modified rule is making us all in modified stage two, knowing that somebody is in stage one still has an impact on which measures that you're going to have to um, to report on. So knowing somebody's attestation history um, is going to be key for that. Um, review your list of new providers. Um, every year that um, we've done this, the, those new ones sneak in. Um, they, it's hard to get all of their proxy information in time to know what their attestation history is, and therefore you're not sure whether um, they've been loaded and, and ready to go like the rest of everybody else. Along those lines, ensure that the proxy assignment has been completed, and of course, review eligibility. So I, I think um, the eligibility part is, is pretty key and relates to the modified rule. So um, they, they put in the modified rule this year that you can be a Medicaid eligible, or I'm sorry, a Medicaid previously eligible provider that no longer is eligible but is able to avoid the Medicare penalties by attesting um, via the CMS or the federal Medicare site. So reviewing people's eligibilities and knowing far enough in advance which way you're going to be attesting for them is also pretty key. And then lastly, I, I say tag, what, do whatever you do in your systems to help you know which providers have some sort of special circumstances associated with them. So probably the most common one we hear is that a provider um, that, that works at multiple locations on two different EHRs and you need to combine their data. So that's probably a, a good one to make sure that you know about well in advance. So moving on to number two, and I, I will move out of the back office here in a second, but this is my second uh, uh, piece of information related to the back office, and that is um, have you registered your providers this payment year? So I, I noted in there that there is an FAQ that CMS has published that, set, that explains that you only need to register once. Um, and so they're very specific about that, that you don't have to do that. And even though you can um, enter the CERT ID on that registration page, um, you are able to override that CERT ID when you go to a test. But I'm going to give you a few reasons why you should re-register them anyway. So first of all, there are, aren't that many screens associated with it. but there are common um, things that show up when you do registration and certainly knowing that well in, adva well in advance of attestation season is, is key. The first one is warning you have been identified as a Medicare Advantage eligible, eligible professional. 
So this, this happens in particular to organizations that have no idea who Medicare Advantage is or have had any interaction with it, but for whom um, they've uh, onboarded a new provider who did. So making sure that um, you know which, which ones are, have that indication and then can work, therefore, with CMS to get that cleaned up. The, the second, and I would say this is the most common issue that we've seen, is that there is no valid, valid PCOS reassignment information matching the inputted NPI. So that's the error message that comes up. But basically what they're saying is that somehow we can't find the payment um, the group NPI that you want us to pay to. That, that is not assigned to this provider. The only way to work through that is usually through your um, third-party administrator. So it takes a little bit of time. Um, if you are in IT, you likely have to work with your finance department in order to get this cleaned up. I think it's crazy at the end of the year to have done all the work that you've all done to get people to meaningful use, be compliant with all the measures, and yet not be able to, uh, to attest for them because of these kinds of errors. And then lastly, there's also the warning related to being a, uh, a hospital-based provider. So every year um, that's recalculated. So if you just go in there and register a provider, you're automatically going to know whether or not that person was considered hospital-based for the current year. So in particular, if you're not going to re-register everybody, you should definitely re-register those that are on the fence. OK. So now I'm going to move a little bit closer into the rule um, so, and, and a little bit closer into the, those, um, deeper into those measures. So one of the other, and you can call it back office, but typically it's done by the IT department and the quality departments is to review exclusions that can be taken and then figure out what is the supporting documentation that's, that's needed in order to support that exclusion. So I know that in the, in the proposed, or I'm sorry, in, no longer proposed, in the, in the rule for modified stage two, there's some language um, for alternate exclusions for the stage one providers if they did not intend to select, um, did not intend to select med reconciliation was one of the common ones. So they've actually explicitly said in there that they know that it is pretty much impossible to find documentation that, that supports you that you did not intend to select that one. So they're not asking for supporting documentation for that. However, you are going to be looking for, they are going to be looking for supporting documentation for some of these other ones. So I pointed out a, an example, which is the specialized registry um, part of the public health measure, measure. So they did change the public health measure, measure and they said that um, if you're a stage two provider that you need to meet two of the three public health reporting options, one being immunization, two being surveillance, and the third being sending information to a specialized registry. Um, you can send things to multiple specialized registries, so you could actually send things to two specialized registries, and those would count as two of your measures under that public health uh, measure. There are some very specific exclusions, though, that can be taken, and if you are in a state or a jurisdiction, as they call it, um, that does not have the capability to send to registries, you're going to need to take some exclusions. And so some of the exclusions that are supported are, is such that um, you're going to need a significant amount of documentation to support it. I try to remind everybody that it's, CMS can audit you up to six years, so you need to document things that, make, that are point in time specific, and this is a really good example of this. So this would be a provider that does not diagnose or treat any disease or condition associated with or collect relevant data that is required by a specialized registry in their jurisdiction. So in this particular case, you, may, you need both information about what the specialized registry is asking for as well as information about this, what the scope of this provider's um, treatment, treatment is. So both pieces of information are going to be key. So I'm moving on to the fourth item, and that is um, my encouragement for, to all of you that you find a way to still maintain those patient engagement initiatives, in particular the uh, view, download, tra transmit, which is the patient electronic access measure, and the secure messaging measure. So in the, in the modified rule, 
2015, you are only required um, to show that you've submitted one, that only one um, patient has viewed, downloaded, or transmitted the information. And then you only have to show that secure messaging wasn't enabled. And I like to say the best way to show that secure messaging is enabled is to have one patient. So you could overachieve and, uh, and show that you have one patient in there. So the, the thresholds are, are this. Um, it, for view, download, transmit, one patient in 2015 and in 2016. In 2017, they ramp you up to 5%, five, to five but then in stage three, which starts in 2018, you, you jump up to 25%. There is a, a lot of conversation out there, and you can see this national partnership and consumer partnership for ETH Health expressed deep disappointment that the patient engagement was not given a higher threshold because they want to do everything possible to encourage that patient engagement. So this is my two cents to tell you to continue to do the work that you're doing. It's nice that the thresholds are lower because we know certainly by all of our clients that um, this is these are hard measures to meet, but reversing any of the work that you're already doing would just hurt you when once it comes to stage three. And then lastly, I, I think this is a great opportunity to expand the knowledge base. So one of the themes, I believe, of this modified rule is pure simplification. So they've done a lot of things to simplify, which is great for all of us. Um, one, one, of course, being that they reduced the number of measures. Uh, the second being that they eliminated the concept of multiple stages so that you can everybody can be in the same stage at the same, same time. So all of that simplification, I think, comes with some opportunity. So, Meaningful use is a program, it's not a person, and organizations are always extremely vulnerable to, um, to turnover if they've made it a person. So if you're the person that does everything meaningful use, this is, is an opportunity because of this simplification to start to move that knowledge to somebody else. The, when, when talking to a few of our clients about um, the changes and how that might impact them and what, what would they be doing differently, I heard loud and clear from them that the most important thing um, they think is to not disrupt it, their current work on the workflow efforts um, and to really not necessarily distract people with a lot of information about what the new um, thresholds are. And, and part of the thinking there is it's har hard enough to work on meeting all of the measures and doing all of the workflow changes to do that, but then to also add kind of a, a moving target into the mix makes it more difficult. So to the extent possible, really think, of, think through how much information your organization needs, and in, partic in particular your provider base, in order to continue to do the work that they need to do to meet meaningful use. And lastly, I say, please embrace the stability here because stage three is not far off. Um, 2018 sounds far away, but um, I, I know that it will be there before we know it. We appreciate um, that we hopefully, hopefully will have two years of stability, of stable measures that we are meeting, um, and that we hope that that also then gives the HR vendors um, enough time to do what they're doing to prepare, the, to prepare you for stage three. And I look forward to your questions um, at the end. And I'll turn it back over to Tom. Great. Thanks, Beth. So I'm going to now continue with uh, uh, the, the discussion onto the PQRS and the value-based modifier side. So I'm just getting control of the presentation here. Um, so you know, for those of you who've been on a number of our webinars the past couple months, uh, some of this will be review, um, but I hope to really talk specifically about this time of the year and what what really this is going to be informed by is what we've seen really make a difference um, with respect to PKRS and VBM optimization at this particular time of the year and later. Um, so the first is really make an attempt to select PKRS measures with the VBM quality score and a consumer audience in mind. Uh, with respect to these measures being publicly reported, as well as impacting your QRUR score, um, uh, the quality score. And what's really interesting is that 
depending on the goals of your organization, uh, you might look at striking the balance among these different factors, quality score on the one hand or consumer audience on the other, um, in different ways because those two goals are not always aligned with each other. And to kind of set up that, that part of the um, consideration set, you know, one thing to, that's interesting to note is that the measures that you've been monitoring throughout this year, depending on how performance may have trended on those measures. Uh, so, for example, at the beginning of the year, you may have aligned your organization around, let's say, 9 to, to 12 or 13, 14 measures and put all kinds of workflows and, and training in place to really optimize um, the movement of, of improvement along those measures. But at the end, what really matters as far as your quality score reimbursement and public reporting is ultimately what measures you report. And what we found is that it's not always those measures that you decide to monitor throughout the year that end up being really the ones that you will ultimately um, want to report if you want to optimize for the best balance of these different factors. Okay, so it's kind of think in your mind that that um, there's there, there's still time to think about separating out and learning from what might have changed throughout the year in terms of what you monitored versus what you actually submit. Seek to try to predict how your choices of the measures that you submit may impact your, your VBM score. Um, and, you know, that really relates to the following point is that there are, will be available in November from the CMS VBM website uh, individual PQRS measure value benchmarks that you can compare your measure values against those benchmarks and get some kind of a sense of how you're going to perform on the VBM quality score. It won't give you an exact sense because in order to do that, you actually have to really try to predictively calculate the score with, with, with the way that the algorithm works as, as a whole. But by looking at those benchmarks, it gives you some sense of, of, of it, at least directionally if you are, are going to be fine or not, okay, with respect to um, where you stand relative to the, to the nation's average on, on those different measures. Um, so really these two got, kind of go hand in hand is just to have that as an additional consideration. Um, what you really want to avoid is um, selecting PTRS measures perhaps in the ways that um, you've seen done over the last few years, particularly in those years before value-based modifier came to play where really selecting measures was primarily about what measures are most convenient to get data for. Okay, and, and that you can't just think that way anymore now because these measures now are actually being rated against peers under the value-based modifier program. Okay, that's kind of the number one thing to right, keep in mind is that you really have another stakeholder here that you have to select measures uh, towards, and that's the BBM program. Okay, so you know one example of how maximizing VBM could be um, really at odds with trying to maximize how you want to represent your providers publicly when these measures are reported publicly is the example of a specialty. Uh, so for example, if you have a group of, car of cardiologists, then you may find that their year-to-date performance on PQRS measures may be such that you want to select a particular set of nine measures in order to maximize how their performance looks in terms of a, from a reimbursement standpoint for value-based modifier. A lot of those measures are likely to be primary care measures. For example, these cardiologists are in a multi-specialty group where the cardiologists are essentially benefiting from the work um, that has been done by the primary care providers. Um, the cardiologists will get credit for that. On the other hand, knowing that those measures will be publicly reported means that um, to a consumer, they may get confused if they see a set of primary care measures actually representing the performance of cardiologists. And that consideration alone may cause you to think, okay, may want to put in a couple of cardiology measures in there as far as what we report, even though it may pull the score down for, for value-based modifier, but we have to keep in mind that these measures are going to be um, available to the public about 18 months from now. Right? So really just uh, making sure you kind of keep the whole balance factors and you don't just simply think about what measures are easiest to get data for. Okay? So that's first... Uh, Tip. The, the second one is um, really understanding as early as possible the full scope and what you need to prepare to do to actually perform the data submission for PQRS using the method that you've decided upon. What is the true administrative effort that's needed by your organization and, and really above and beyond 
the, the, the fees that you may be uh, spending with a third party to have them assist you with this effort. So what a good best practice is, is really probably by sometime next month at the latest is to really ask your vendor, if you haven't already selected a vendor, then certainly get started on trying to select a vendor, whether it's a registry vendor or, or another type of vendor that's helping you with the data submission. Um, really, what are the specific implementation timeline and the tasks? Try to getting early early visibility on that can, can really save a lot of headache and a lot of fire drills later on in, in submission season. Another best practice, but it's, it's rarely done, but uh, I think it will be increasingly important, is to really try to do a dry run of the data extraction steps that your vendor has directed you to do or that you have um, really designed based on what the requirements are given your uh, PCARS reporting method. Um, so for example, if you are going to use the EHR direct method for submitting PCRS measures for a GPRO or for an individual provider, you know, go to your, your vendor and really learn about how can you, you get the QRDA file export that you're going to need. What you will find is that sometimes those exports are not available until um, maybe a month or two or maybe even several, just several weeks before the EHR direct filing deadline. And that type of dependency is really good to try to find out early um, rather than getting right in the middle of submission season and seeing that the QRDA isn't available for you and then you have nothing to submit. Um, another big one is understanding what kind of data elements um, your registry vendor may need from you, particularly um, if you have a lot of individual provider submissions. Um, the uh, registries can vary quite greatly from each other in terms of the formats that they'll want you to get the data into, um, the extent of the patients that they'll want you to um, deliver data on in order to meet the minimum reporting requirements. There's a lot of very registry and vendor specific things that would be good to try to have a, a test run of, at least some subset of, way before the end of the year comes. Also plan to capture what's in your PQRS audit trail. And it, it turns out that PQRS audits are actually happening right now. Um, there has been a third party firm hired by CMS that has actually performed a number of these audits. And we've seen cases where an initial uh, failure or partial failure of an audit has then triggered four or five subsequent audits for that same client on different uh, PQRS measures. One of the things is being, making sure that in particular, if you um, are using a method such as registry, where there is a lot of manual data extraction involved, that um, the auditors will really want to make sure that um, there are any kind of sources of error of that process you know, were mitigated and will want to, for example, look at trying to identify the patients that make up your numerators and denominators, like your, the specific beneficiary IDs of those patients and be able to have an audit trail to be able to trace back and support those numbers can also, you know, can be very helpful um, in terms of uh, being ready for a potential potential audit. It'll be interesting to see uh, how the audit activity may change over the next 18 to 24 months as more and more money is actually tied to PQRS performance initially with value-based modifier, but of course with the MIPS program, um, if, you, if you run through the numbers, you're having two to three times more money um, ultimately tied to PQRS measure performance than was ever the case in the past. Uh, and that tends to attract more audit activity. Okay, and finally, real real obvious one is to try to submit data as early as possible. <clears throat> fully anticipate that in Q1, it's going to be a record high number of submissions through all of the different PQRS methods in the CMS. Um, in particular, registry and EHR direct and data submission vendor as more providers move from claims-based PQRS reporting those other methods. And if past presence is any indication, that can cause performance issues at CMS. And you want to avoid a situation where the website times out or you're not even able to um, submit your information or your registry company can't submit the information on your behalf uh, until very close to the final deadline. Okay, so th this, will, this year will, should be an especially high, high traffic year to, to keep track of. Okay. And then the la lastly here, and then we will uh, get right into Q&A, is, you know, take a, take a real close look at your uh, outlier providers. Um, because as, as some of our, other, our past webinars have shown that you can have as few as 3% of the, 
of the lowest performing providers cause a significant drop in your quality score for the entire uh, group. And that's because VBM is, is not a linear algorithm. It, can, it really puts a harsh spotlight um, under certain conditions on particular providers or on particular measures. And so by really trying to identify those outliers early, um, it opens up a number of options for you. Um, one is that there may very well be a problem or a fixable error in how data has been captured for those providers that's resulting in an artificially low score set of scores. Um, the other is that there may be some providers that may either be so new to the practice um, whereby they haven't had a chance to really improve their performance to the average peer level of the rest of your group, or providers that um, may even have, may have very low Part B billings, you know, whereby if you can really match their performance and see how much, how much uh, of, 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 of financial impact is actually at stake with respect to the providers, you may decide early on to consciously exclude certain providers from your reporting at all. And, and, and thereby uh, be automatically penalized, but basically being able to avoid the cost and the effort and look towards next year as a, as a year to really focus on, on those providers again. So looking at outlier providers can allow you to try to work through those decisions early, in particular before you get into submission season where there's a lot of administrative tasks that are gonna, gonna really eat up a lot of uh, your staff's hours and try to, try to do this uh, well before the end of the year. Who are those outliers? Um, talked about that in terms of uh, potentially writing off some providers for this year if you're reporting providers individually. And um, we've also found that being able to really identify those outlier providers before the real busy season can also be an opportunity to spark a discussion with them. Um, and we've actually seen this be very, very effective where, where really no provider wants to be the one that's holding back the whole group from getting a decent quality score. Um, and, and that's uh, some information that, that uh, uh, you know, has generally, if presented correctly, been very effective in terms of uh, trying to drive some performance improvement. Okay. Well, as usual, we'll have this presentation available for download as well as a video of the entire session here. And here are just some additional resources. Some of these you've seen before. I've tried to make it a little bit simpler than in past webinars in terms of giving you all a couple of fewer links to look at. But um, you can certainly look at any one of these, and, and it can help uh, inform you a little bit more about some of the details we're not able to cover today uh, across all these different programs. So Carol, I think with that, we'll get right into Q&A. Hey, yeah, well, I'm back. And uh, no surprise. Um, Got a lot of questions uh, from the audience here today, as well as those that were asked during from the audience when they registered. Uh, I was going to try to see if I could um, sort of put this in two stages, like MU questions and PQRS questions. But a lot of them are are tweeners or they're cross they're crossovers. So <laughs> I think they will be kind of completely random. Uh, yeah. So I say we uh, we dive uh, we dive right in, and uh, again, no particular order. We're just going to take these questions as 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 they as they come in. All right. First of first of all, actually, the, we get this question quite a bit, which is, can you attest with any 90-day period from now until the deadline date? That is correct. You are able to choose any 90-day period, um, including going backwards prior to when the rule was published. So it does not have to be quarterly, a calendar quarter, which is, I think, uh, what most, most, most people actually think that, that that's what that has to be. Um, can you please confirm that the minimum threshold for 2015 PQRS reporting via EHR Direct is one Medicare patient with data? Thanks. Yes, it is. One, it, and, it is. one and one and only. <laughs> one, yeah. That, that's interesting because um, the, the, the patient threshold is also different for different methods. Um, so for registry, for example, it's 50% of all the patients that could potentially fit into the denominator of a particular measure uh, have, have to have a minimum to be to be reported. Um, and in contrast to EHR Directory, you said the, the barrier is actually, uh, the threshold is actually quite low. Uh, on the other hand, for EHR Direct is that you do have to report each and every single patient for which you have the measure value calculated for. 
Okay, so you're not able to just say, oh, I only want to report it on these 50% for EHR Direct. You have to report on all those patients that are captured by the EHR, uh, the EHR Direct mechanism in terms of what their CQM values actually are. But at a minimum, it's one Medicare patient per, per measure at a minimum. Okay. All right. Uh, sort of a asking, soliciting your opinion and, and from a 30,000 feet up level, could you please provide what the expectations are or interpret or interpretations for the recent, recently released proposed rules, including quality, quality measures? I'm assuming they mean for, mm -hmm. for stage three. We could take it in either the stage three direction or we could talk about the 2016 proposed physician fee, fee schedule that includes PKRS rules. So maybe Beth, I'll should I throw it over to you, Beth, for stage three? You talked kind of a little bit about that, and I can touch a little bit on the 2016 PKRS rule. A crossover question. <laughs> yes, it is. That's the new world, right? That's the world that we'll be living in. Exactly no, seriously. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing yeah, is a crossover. It's, uh, uh, it's, all, it's all coming together. <laughs> well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly fairly high um, because, to be honest, I, I, I want to make sure that I – I, I know the, the regulations at the 30,000 foot level, but I'm not able to rattle them off as quick. Um, so conceptually, you know, I think what we saw when stage two was published, that um, there was alignment finally between the quality measures for meaningful use as well as PQRS, meaning you could get credit for um, the, the CQM portion of meaningful use by um, reporting with one of the um, options that they said that you can get credit for, which in includes um, EHR Direct. So, so I think we saw that alignment. I think in stage three, what they've done is they've taken the alignment even further. Um, right now, the requirement is does not force you to send any information electronically. So while the EHR vendors um, theoretically can report that or can generate that information into an electronic format, and certainly the calculation engine is the certified part of their systems, they haven't had to put that, um, that data into a specific form in order for the purposes of meaningful use. And I believe that for stage three, the requirement is that that information start to be sent electronically. So I think they've taken it one step further um, to, again, continue that alignment. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I think the other complementary part, which definitely has some overlap with MU, uh, is with respect to the 2016 proposed rule um, uh, for the fee, uh, fee schedule, which will include the PKRS rules. There's, there's really um, one in particular aspect of that that relates to kind of the higher level push towards uh, consumer level reporting, um, transparency to consumers in terms of provider performance, is that currently the publicly recorded PTRS measures actually um, have a five-star rating scale. For those of you who are in the Medicare Advantage role, you're, you probably have nightmares about, or, or dreams, you know, about the <laughs> five-star rating that you get from Medicare Advantage. And um, what, what's interesting now is that, is that CMS is, has put into this proposed rule, and, it's, and we'll see in about a month or so whether it gets finalized, is that the um, current five-star rating scale is strictly a static scale. In other words, everyone could potentially get five stars. If, if everyone is, is, is scoring above 90% performance rate in a given measure, they could, everyone can get five stars. Everyone can be a winner. But what's, what's now being proposed is that the five-star scale be, be converted into a, a peer ranking um, scale, whereby only a certain percentile of the population, provider population will get five stars and so on down. You could have someone who only has one star, and they actually are 80% performance rate, but the benchmark for the, the country might be at the 90, 90, 92% level. And that's a radical change if it goes through. That frankly mirrors the way that VDM currently works now, value-based modifier, where it's all peer ranking. And in MIPS, of course, we all know from past webinars here um, that uh, yeah. that will certainly be everyone rated on a, on a curve. Um, so that's something to really keep track of is sort of that overall push what's going to happen in terms of rep things that can impact provider reputation. Um, one last point is to bring it back to the MU side. Is One thing I, I think it's interesting about the um, 2015 edition certification rule, which is there obviously to support stage three, is that CMS has, has really demarcated the certification process in general and the requirements in general around certification from just the meaningful use-related aspects of certification. 
So what you'll see in the certification rule for 2015 is there's a whole bunch of other requirements. Some are optional, some are not, um, depending on the scope you want to get certified for. That, um, those, that that long list of certification features may or may not have anything to do with meaningful use. And what they've actually done is they've taken the meaningful use related parts of certification and they've actually now co-located that um, with the meaningful use part of the regulation. All right? and, and so what that's an interesting signal is that as we move forward as a um, kind of a health IT industry, um, uh, both vendors as well as clients, private organizations, that there will be a broader um, mandate to oversee and certify many other types of health IT modules other than EHRs. Um, and and that, has, that has some potentially broad ranging implications in terms of what's that next generation of health IT application going to actually look like, which, which I think is really exciting to, to think about. And it looks like you know, there's some sort of movement in that area from a regu 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 regulatory standpoint. Uh, do you uh, do you two expect to see any new hardship exemptions due to the lateness of the final final rules? No, um, they they did they were pretty specific about that. Um, there were some comments that they recommended for more hardship exemptions, and they basically said no. Um, they do <laughs> have <laughs> um, they they did say they expanded some of the language around filing for the hardship exemption, and that is that. Um, that you can, under I think the term they used was extraordinary circumstances, um, including change of vendor, um, change of EHR, um, that that they would accept um, the the application for the hardship exemption. They and it would be reviewed on a case by case basis. So they were very specific that that they're not going to expand it, but that they did change some language that would potentially give more people an option. Um, to submit one. Got <clears throat> several questions related to uh, updates or overview of, of, of what is expected in, in MU Stage 3, uh, which obviously there are a lot of things that are expected in, in Stage 3, but certainly one of those is related to the patient engagement thresholds. Perhaps talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and answer, answer all, partial, partial answer to some of these questions uh, being asked. Yeah. Related to stage three, but I, I know there are again a number of things and expectations for stage three, obviously. But patient engagement is certainly at the top of the list. It, it's it certainly is. Um, you know, I think uh, that that's why I mentioned that example specifically when I was saying don't don't stop your view, download, transmit, don't stop stop your secure messaging. Um, there was quite a bit of comments in the comment period around not making the threshold um, as high for stage three simply because they still, you know, I, I think there's still some feeling that the patients aren't quite ready to have that kind of uh, relationship, um, but they were very specific that they, they felt like it was the way um, that they needed to go and they needed to um, raise the threshold to that degree in order to really create patient engagement um, at a broader level. Um, now, one thing I did not mention that was unique about the rule when it was published is that it was published with a comment period. So, I, so it's the first time that has ever happened, but it's a final rule with a comment period, and, and what we think is that is to appease um, those people that really were not wanting them to publish stage three, and they were wanting stage three to be um, separated from this modified stage two so that they could have more feedback on how stage two does um, before they, they set those kinds of thresholds for stage three. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump back to PQRS real quick. If, if participating in PQRS uh, via GPRO, how do you exclude a provider? Aren't all providers automatically included? Uh, yes, that, that is correct. And I probably should have qualified my uh, discussion around dropping providers to the case where organizations are reporting providers individually. Um, that's definitely uh, the, the one uh, caveat I, I neglected to throw in there. Um, with uh, you know, with GPRO mechanisms, uh, if you look at web interface and registry and EHR direct in particular, um, I just want to kind of leave with the point that you know each and every one of them is kind of its own animal, and that um, you can have a case where you have the very same PQRS a number, 
um, that has three different versions of that measure through each one of those methods. And you could have entirely different measure values um, for that one same PQRS measure number across these three different um, these three different methods. So that's something to kind of keep track of because we've also found that um, you don't want to uh, get lulled into a kind of a sense of complacency if it turns out, let's say, your CQMs are looking great for this measure, but then you actually use a completely different method other than the EHR direct report those measures, your performance could be entirely different. Um, so that's another thing to kind of keep track of as you get close to submission season is what are your actual values look like. And again, those values that you want to report may be different from the ones you, you, you've been monitoring throughout the year if you really want to optimize your, your reported performance. Okay. Uh, we actually have uh, gotten this question several times uh, since the MIPS came out in in uh, in April. Is is MIPS replacing both EP and e EHMU penalties, or is this EP only, and is this EP only Medicare? Yeah, great question. It is, it is specifically Medicare Part B only, and it is uh, for EPs. Um, of course, there's many different definitions of EPs. You know, we're talking about M meaningful use EPs. Are we talking about PQRS eligible professionals? Um, but you know, in terms of the incentives and the penalties for Medicare, for the meaningful use Medicare incentives, uh, MIPS is not touching those. Those will proceed as usual. Um, what uh, what it is what MIPS is doing is it's consolidating the Medicare meaningful use penalty alongside the PQRS automatic penalty for not reporting, um, as well as the, the payment adjustment for value based modifier. It's rolling all of those into a single payment adjustment factor. Um, okay, but, it, but basically the Medicare meaningful use incentives will will, will continue. Um, onwards until they're exhausted, and, and they actually are almost exhausted on the incentive side for Medicaid. Yeah. But for Medicaid, yeah. Medicaid is entirely separate. Yeah. Medicaid yeah. means is entirely separate. In fact, the Medicaid ME program is set to go through uh, 2021, right? I think 2021? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Much, correct. much longer tail. Yeah. Uh, can you confirm the percentage that qualifies measures to be met for PQRS? Not sure I understand that question, but... Yeah, interesting. The, the and the, the key word there is really the word met. Yeah, they the um, uh, yeah the asker put it in quotation yeah. marks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it relates to a question that was asked earlier. Was for different PQRS methods, in order or for different PQRS reporting methods, such as registry, such as EHR Direct, there are certain minimum data requirements for each individual measure that you report through either one of those mechanisms. So for example, before we talked about with the registry, it's a minimum of 50% of patients that fit into that denominator have to be reported upon. Mm -hmm. um, for EHR Direct, it's a minimum of one Medicare patient. Um, so, if, so if MET is, is interpreted in the sense that of meeting the minimum reporting requirement to avoid an automatic negative adjustment, then that those are the minimums for those two particular methods. Okay. Um, if on the other hand the word met means is there a, a static performance threshold above which if you do better than that performance threshold on that one measure, you will somehow get a higher level of reimbursement, okay? Then for P, for the PQRS program, the original PQRS program standalone, there is no sense of pay for performance there. It's strictly pay for reporting. Okay? In terms of you, you meet the minimum amount of data needed for a required number of measures, you will, you will um, avoid the, the automatic penalty there. For value-based modifier, it's really about how well do your measures do better relative to national benchmarks for each measure, and then how do you roll up those deltas above or below the national benchmark for each measure into a single number, which is called your quality score, which is what you see on your on your, your QRUR report, your quality resource um, uh, resource and, and, and use report, um, and and so there the the, the measure. You know, the, the, the quote-unquote met is really depending on what your, your goals are in terms of do you want to just be in the neutral territory for, for value-based modifier or do you want to get into the incentive tier, then it means in theory that you have to meet a certain level of performance on your measures that you decide to submit that will be used for that calculation in order to get to that threshold. So it's, um, it's a little bit of a different answer depending on what the intent um, of, of the question was. The definition. Um, and perhaps that person can uh, email. 
Tom at SAIgnite.com offline and, and give a more clarification. If PQRS sure. data is submitted for a physician, then will it count for CQMs for MU as well? So it depends on, on which it, method of PQRS reporting you use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, if it's, if it's a single provider we're talking about, if it's through the EHR direct mechanism, which is really using the same CQMs, clinical quality measures, that are one and the same with what you report for meaningful use, uh, then that provider will uh, get credit for the CQM uh, obligation for meaningful use, okay, if they report using PQRS EHR direct. Um, on the other hand, if a, an individual provider uses, let's say, the measures group method through registry, well, that doesn't give them double credit for the meaningful use program. It's only EHR direct or an electronic means of calculating and submitting the measure that actually will, will uh, qualify for meaningful use double credit. So it depends on the method that you choose. Uh, Beth, did, did you did you want to weigh in? No, no that was that was that was that was that was that, was, that, was, that, was, that exact thing. I said I, I was like I couldn't have said yeah. it any better. I couldn't have said it. I couldn't have said it at all. <laughs> is, it too, <laughs> is it too late to submit PQRS data for 2015 for 2017? Yeah, so I think what the question relates to is that. Hmm. Um, under the PQRS and the value-based modifier program, in fact, for meaningful use uh, penalty side, the same thing is that there's a two-year calendar year lag between the performance year and the actual payment adjustment year. Um, so with respect to that time frame, you have, depending on your PQRS method that you choose, you have either until the end of February or the end of March to submit your full year 2015 PQRS measure values, and those values, um, for those various programs will determine what is your payment adjustment, if any, for the 2017 payment year. So the answer is yes, there's enough time. It's the filing deadlines for those PQRS methods, end of February, end of March, okay. for this year. Uh, a couple questions related to your comment about excluding outlier providers. First and foremost, how would practice exclude an individual considered an outlier provider? And somebody else chimed in wanting to know what you mean by how they would identify a provider as an outlier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great question. So um, the most common situation we see is, let's say if you have 100, uh, let's say 50, 50 providers uh, under a single tax ID, and the organization decides to report the providers on an individual provider basis using, um, uh, using a given PQRS method. Let's say they, they decided to use, uh, let's say they decide to use uh, PQRS registry. Um, then um, what I'm referring to is that what CMS will do for those 50 individual submissions is that CMS on their side, they're going to add up the measure numerator and denominators for every single measure that was selected by each provider, and that will result in a set of group measure values. Okay, so for example, if, if 25 of those 50 providers had all selected the, in, uh, had submitted data for the uh, influenza immunization measure, then CMS would simply add up the numerator and denominator separately for um, the, the tw those 25 providers that actually reported that measure. And you'll end up with a group value of numerator divided by group value of denominator give you a group measure rate. Okay, And those, those group measure rates are actually going to be used to calculate as, input, as inputs into the value-based modifier quality score for the entire tax ID, for the entire TIN. So what I'm referring to is that um, surprisingly, but it's true, is that you can have situations where, let's say, one or two of those providers out of 50 um, happen to have poor measure performance on certain measures. Often those measures are, are, are measures that very few other providers in the organization may have um, reported, but that their hugely negative performance in those measures relative to those measure benchmarks can actually have a disproportionately large effect on the quality score for all 50 docs when, when, when CMS sums up the data at the, at the TIN level, at the group level. And so what that means is that you can, you, you're faced with a trade-off, is that you can see situations where if you decide, let's say, to not report those one or two providers entirely, you just completely decide to write them off and give them another year to try to improve, you will um, have to accept the automatic negative penalty from PQRS program and value based modifier program for not reporting, let's say, those two providers. But by removing their data from the overall 
data of the entire group that's reported, you may find that the group's quality score can increase tremendously, um, you know, to the point where the one or two providers, which is maybe 2% of the providers, can actually cause the, the by removing them, their data out of the, the cohort, can cause the group score to actually increase substantially. Um, so it's just to have a level of awareness um, in terms of how to identify those, those providers. Um, certainly looking at peer benchmarks is very, very useful, even just within your own group. Um, to see who might be those one or two standard deviations below what the what the group average is, just based on your own your own data, um, and and that can be very informative. Another is to again in November look at the the value based modifier quality benchmarks that will be available on the CMS uh, value based modifier website, and and look at those measures across each of those providers and see whether or not you're getting some um, values measure values that are, that are hugely below the um, the national benchmark, and those are those are measures and providers to keep your eye on. I'm going to take time for a couple more questions. I'm going to take one MU and uh, and one uh, MIPS MIPS related. Uh, if you've never tested to meaningful use, can you test for your 2016, or is it too late? It is not too late. <laughs> and you are able to attest in um, 2016 and I believe that will count um, so that you don't get penalties in 2017. Um, in 2016, although it will be a full year reporting for everybody else, any new um, new providers they'll be able to attest to a 90-day period instead. It's never too late. Well, no, actually, eventually it is too late, but yeah, it's not too late right now. Yeah. Um, when CMS says compares to, comparing to peers, do they mean within the practice or a broader geographic area? Mm -hmm. And if comboed with a specialist report as a GPRO, how does this affect their rating? So kind of two questions in one. Mm -hmm. Great question. And, and really where the peer rating comes into play is in the value-based modifier mm -hmm. of VBM program. Um, when you look at a VBM scorecard, otherwise known as this QRUR report, you'll see that your organization is represented on a two-axis uh, chart, where quality is on one axis, cost is on the other axis, and you'll see a whole bunch of blue dots on there. Every one of those dots is a is a group of providers represented by their tax ID that DM the CMS has deemed to be in the same cohort as you. Okay, and you'll see your little dot. There's a little red dot, and, and where you stand relative to those other dots. So. So just to get the terminology right is that by, by cohort for VBM, it's, it's, the, it's the group of providers that CMS has deemed that you're comparable to. Now, the first question related to, okay, is there any, any specialty bias to this in terms of if, if you are a, a TIN that is dominated by one specialty, will that automatically put you into a cohort that is also a bunch of other specialists? The answer is, is only CMS knows because <laughs> you, you don't know the identity of those, other, of those other dots. You just know that there's other dots there. Um, what, however, what CMS has said and published publicly is that that at, at a high level there are at least two cohorts, but they make no guarantee that these are the only two, co 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 two co cohorts could ever be used. One is if you are a group that has 10 eligible providers or more, 10 PQRS eligible providers or more, that they will rate you against other groups that are also 10 providers or more. Um, but there's no mention of any kind of ge geography split or any specialty split or anything. Okay, uh, the other potential uh, cohort, which um, they have explicitly said, is if you are in a group that is with, with has fewer than 10 eligible providers for PQRS, then you will be compared against all other groups around the country that have uh, at least one provider. Okay, so it's basically everyone. All right, it's, it's not just looking at the, the larger groups. It's, it's, it, you, you'd be rated against everyone. And I think that's to help dilute out the effect, the fact that larger groups may have some um, operational advantages. And it's kind of, it, it's their way of sort of more leveling the playing field in terms of who they compare you to. But, but ultimately, this is something that CMS can certainly change um, as the years go by. And if we're going to certainly get into MIPS, there could be a whole other way of, of, of doing cohort analysis that could put you into, you know, different cohorts depending on, on where, what, CMS's policy goal, goals are for that given year. So not a really co complete answer, but um, that's basically what's out there right now. And we are seeing that folks are being being put into different different cohorts right now. Okay. 
Uh, well, before we sign off, uh, just a couple more things. If you have a question for Tom or Beth, please email them, uh, tom at saignite.com, beth at saignite.com. They'll take your questions and uh, share whatever they can, I'm sure. Um, some other resources, just to remind you, if you go to saignite.com slash resources dash one, you can get more information about MU, PQRS, VBM, and of course MIPS. They've also got their frequently asked questions on VBM on their website as well, so check that out. And please join their group. Uh, it's an open group, Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, if you go to LinkedIn and search on groups. Tom, Beth, thank you so much for your time, and we'll look forward to uh, setting up our our ABCs of MITS for November. Sounds thanks. great, Carol. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.